Uh, welcome, everybody. My name is Maria Arquero de Alarcón, and I'm a faculty member here at Taubman College. Um, I'm also the director of the Urban Design degree, and we are thrilled to have you here. You are coming from all over the world. Um, we have many guests um, joining as um, part of the team member that work together in, in this symposium that is co-sponsored, as you know, by Taubman College and the Urban Studies Foundation. Um, we are thrilled to have you here today because um, we are uh, spending uh, the next 24 hours, maybe 26 hours, having a conversation about how we as planners, designers, um, geographers, sociologists, in fact, academic and practitioners are actually working on finding ways around to what we are calling these emerging urbanisms. These um, ways in which we see our regions transforming and evolving over time, and we are continuously asking ourselves how to retool what we do, the questions we ask, and how we work in the different uh, projects that we work to actually serve with the kind of intelligence, with the resources, and with the imagination uh, that we all need to, to deal with these very, very urgent and important issues. So I'm going to be very brief, but I just want to remind everybody that this is just the beginning, an amazing beginning with Lester Spence um, to a series of conversations that are going to be happening here tomorrow, starting very early and taking us really, really busy uh, during the day. And we hope to see you all here and joining us to, to engage in the conversation. I'm equally excited to have my colleague, Josh Akers, coming from uh, Durban uh, to do the introduction of our keynote um, speaker, Lester Spence. Josh. Move it over here. Thank you. Um, it's truly a privilege uh, to introduce our keynote speaker uh, for our symposium, Emerging Urbanisms in Deindustrializing Regions. Uh, on behalf of the symposium organizers, we'd also like to thank the UM Department of Afro-American and African Studies for their generous co-sponsorship of tonight's lecture. Our speaker tonight is Lester Spence. Spence is a professor of political science and Africana studies, an award-winning scholar, author, and teacher. He's published two books, Stare in the Darkness, Hip Hop and the Limits of Black Politics, which was the winner of the 2012 W.E.B. Du Bois Distinguished Book Award, and Knocking the Hustle Against the Neoliberal Turn in Black Politics, winner of both the Baltimore City Paper and Baltimore Magazine 2016 Best Nonfiction Book Awards. Uh, one co-edited journal, over a dozen essays and think pieces and a range of publications, including the American Journal of Political Science, Political Research Quarterly, the New York Times, Jacobin, Salon, and the Boston Review. He's currently working on two book-length projects, uh, examining contemporary AIDS crisis in black communities and the growing role of police in major American cities, uh, particularly examining Baltimore, the Baltimore uprising in the context of ever-increasing police budgets and stagnating spending for other city services. Um, so it, it's a long list of accomplishments. I needed to read that one. But I would say uh, beyond these, uh, as a scholar and public intellectual, I, I want to note that the driving focus of Spence's work is on working class black spaces. And this is not only in his research, but in the ways and means of communication from nearly four decades of DJing to photography to teaching. Um, he's mastered the art of theory in a common language that offers the opportunity of approach rather than closing off knowledge. Uh, I came to know Lester personally because of his book, uh, Knocking the Hustle, actually resonated with my working class students, uh, working class undergrads at Dearborn. Uh, they made it their mission to essentially host a symposium that included him, um, and they were not disappointed. Uh, more than one of them has mentioned years later how Lester influenced their lives and the way they think about their regions and themselves. So no pressure tonight, Lester. Um, his talk is titled, Off the Battle, Reemerging Urbanisms and the Future of Detroit. Please welcome Dr. Lester Spence. Uh, thank you for that uh, warm introduction. I, what I don't think Josh mentioned is I, wow, 
Uh, I started here at the University of Michigan in the summer of 1987, right after uh, the third black action movement. I was a, the reason I was able to start in the summer of 87 is because students in 1968, 69 and BAM 1 and 1975 of BAM 2 actually created a program that ended up becoming the Comprehensive Studies program that created a program to bring students in in the summer to kind of bridge them into undergrad. So I'm a direct product of, uh, of black student activism. And as if being here from 1987 to 1991 wasn't enough, I ended up staying until 2000 because I, where I received, because I received my PhD here. So every time I step foot on this campus, I feel like I'm coming home. Every time I step foot on this campus, I think about the blood, sweat, and tears that were shed for me to be here, and then the blood, sweat, and tears me and a number of my people, many of whom are in the audience, shed to make Michigan live up to its greatest ideals. So it's always a blessing to come here. I always feel at home here, and this is just wonderful. Um, random and trifling, side note, actually it's not random and trifling. So I actually have, uh, I'm a parent of two kids. Uh, actually, I'm a parent of five kids, but Josh didn't mention that either. But my youngest one has an event in Baltimore right now that she's gonna need to be Ubered away from at around seven o'clock. So around seven o'clock, I'm gonna actually need to make sure she gets Ubered to her, st her spot. So I'm gonna stop it and y'all can do whatever y'all wanna do with this video, but I'm gonna just let y'all know that in advance. Um, when, when I was invited, you know, and the thing is, is when you're invited, shout out to Katie, they ask you, what do you want to talk about? And they really want that in advance, right? They want that long in advance. So I'm hanging out with Josh at Motor City Wine because, you know, I was there. I was back home with my parents for the holiday. And I'm like, okay, I think I want to do this. And, you know, I thought about DJing it. And I was like, nah, I don't want to. So I, I came up with this loose idea. And then, you know, Katie's like, yo, we need a title. <laughs> Can you give me this title? Where's Katie at? She's in here. Yeah, and she was really wonderful. She was really wonderful. You know, administrators are like, are like, are like dope, right? She, she, she just, we need a title. So I gave her a title, and the title really fits, but I've been working on this talk up till about 5.50. Because that's, what, what I want to do, I, what I really started thinking about was the idea of emergent urbanisms, right? And... There is a way in which what's going on is new, and we should think about what's happening in, in urban spaces in a range of different contexts as new, but I don't think of them as being emergent as much as I think they're re-emergent. So I'm gonna give you a, uh, now there's a, there's a bad way to think about this. So I'm gonna talk about the bad way. I'm gonna jump to black politics for a second. So we're organizing against police brutality now more than we have in a, more than a few decades. And Michelle Alexander wrote a wonderful book uh, called The New Jim Crow that really gave organizers and black folk and people are interested, a really nice way to think about what was happening as far as the relationship between race and the prison industrial complex. The challenge with that dynamic is as neat as a catchphrase as it is, what's going on actually is not the new Jim Crow, right? And I'll just give you a, a random and trifling example of why it's not the new Jim Crow. So there was a moment in time in Baltimore where I was, um, I had gotten into a car crash. I write about this a little bit in Knocking the Hustle. I gotten into a car crash. Uh, I was in the office club late. I leave the office Saturday night, like maybe 1.30 a.m. I get hit uh, and my minivan, I got five kids. My minivan ended up getting, ends up getting destroyed and I don't have the money to even get a loaner. So there was a moment in time where I was driving basically all these hoopties, you know, to get to work, right? Uh, one hoopty, like, had a, I'm sorry, an inexpensive car that barely functioned. 
So, so I was driving, and, I, and, and because I knew the police were going to stop me, I would drive the car in all these weird ways so I wouldn't get stopped by the police because I was driving these hooties. I got stopped several times by the police in that moment. One time, I got stopped by the police. I didn't have a driver's license. I didn't have a photo ID, and I didn't know whose car I was driving. And I got stopped by the police about a mile north of the epicenter of the Baltimore City Uprising, right? And I got nothing. I got no ticket. I got nothing, right? So, so the police officer comes, white police officer comes over to me, and he asked me to, you know, ask me what's going on. I'm explaining, and he's like, you know, you're not going to tell me a story, are you? And I, and I interrupt him as he's interrupting me, right? I act like Black people imagine white people act every day when they're interacting with the police. I'm acting as if I was white. And I wasn't even thinking about it. I just was like, oh, listen to my story. You're going to listen to my story? So I told him the story, and I got nothing. I got stopped one day after I got in a minivan, you know, after I got in a minivan replaced. I was driving back with my kids. And my son is supposed to be here. He's a, a graduating senior at Michigan. Go Blue. Um, and he could probably remember this. They stopped me, not one, not two, three police officers actually stopped me and pulled me over to the side in this minivan. And I'm in there and I'm trying to think about what I did. I still don't have my license, by the way. And the police officer comes up to me and he's like, um, we got word that there was someone driving a minivan that fits your description, waving a gun out of the window, but we know that wasn't you. Now, this is nighttime. All they did was he stuck his hand, he looked at me, he typed me and determined that I wasn't the droid they were looking for, right? Now, if this was the new Jim Crow, if this was really the new Jim Crow, what would have happened in that instance? With my, with my kids in the car, they would have pulled me out of the car. They would have searched the, searched the car. They might have searched the kids, right? In that first instance I talked about, right, where I don't have a license, I don't even know whose car I'm driving, right? What happens to me there? I don't just get a ticket. I might even get thrown in jail, right, if this was the new Jim Crow. It's not the new Jim Crow, right? It's something very different. We have a dynamic where the police are really geared towards uh, policing certain types of race, gendered, and classed bodies. And I'm not one of them. Using the new Jim Crow as, as a term is a nice catchphrase, but it causes us empirically to misunderstand what's going on and to the certain extent we're thinking about political solutions, it causes us to get the political solutions wrong. Right. So when I talk about re-emergent urbanisms, I don't want to make that mistake. But I do want to suggest that there are patterns. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to talk about Detroit and see and show you some of these patterns. Frequently called the most cosmopolitan city of the Midwest, Detroit today stands at the threshold of a bright new future, one rich with the promise of fulfillment. In this bustling city on the Straits, where British and American flags soon followed the French, a spirit of brotherhood was born and nurtured, foreshadowing the city's international character. Here, people from many nations have met and mixed and built a metropolis of thriving commerce and culture. The Detroit River flows past the city's front door, the world's busiest waterway. This river is a vital passage to the Great Lakes and to the St. Lawrence Seaway beyond. Detroiters just naturally take to the water. They enjoy more sparkling, pure water than any similar area in the world. Detroit, the crossroads of half the population of the United States is but minutes away by bridge or tunnel from Canada. Between these friendly neighbors, 
the Detroit River forms part of the world's longest undefended boundary. Detroiters are responding to an exciting new vision. There is a resurgence of civic pride and unfettered imagination. A new renaissance is changing the face of the city. This renaissance, seen everywhere, is the direct result of considered planning, the applied skills of planners, idea men, organizers, builders, Detroiters who welcome and respond to challenges. Today, they are charting new courses, taking new action, creating a new concept of urban efficiency. This concept of a finer Detroit takes bold new form. Designing skill blends with imagination and experience. Sleeves rolled up, Detroit levels and shifts and carves the contours of a new city. And a new spirit of progress matches the vision of its people. New buildings put solid roots in the ground and stretch toward the sky. Reflected here is planning with a purpose. New office buildings alter the landscape, each in turn becoming a bright landmark of progress. Detroit is rebuilding to a master plan of beauty and public service. Detroit is daring to reach up. The inner city is becoming an exciting place to live. Convenient to shop. So Josh said that I was a DJ. That's the one DJ clip in the whole talk. So what that is, is the Amazon headquarters pitch. And what I layered on top of it was the first three minutes and 35 seconds of a pitch made by Mayor Jerome Kavanaugh in 1967, a few months before the, uh, the rebellion, right? And it's funny because at that moment in time, uh, a, he was the youngest mayor up until Kilpatrick, but B, people are talking about Kavanaugh as a, as a, as a potential vice presidential candidate. And then it all goes to, you know, after the rebellion, it all changes. If you think about that mix, that's a mix that actually works, except for a little bit, right? There's a little bit of time where the sound doesn't quite match what you're seeing, but it works. So a 1967 pitch from the city of Detroit to, to, uh, to, to businesses can fit almost perfectly the, ninth, the, the 20, what, 2018, 2019 pitch Detroit made to Amazon. And in that case, I actually don't think, I don't think uh, Mayor Duggan was directly involved. I think primarily it was, uh, it was Dan Gilbert, right? So when I'm talking about, when, when we're thinking about re, you know, emergent urbanisms, it's like, okay, what goes on where some 52, 53 years later, you can have kind of the same dynamic or similar dynamic. So I'm just gonna walk through some uh, other examples of that. Um, so University of Michigan is funny because back in the day, so all my people who were here from when I was a kid, I think we're all from Detroit. Chicago was closer to Ann Arbor than, Det than Detroit was. Right, like, you know, as far as socially, right? Nobody, there was no, tra there no, was no buses going to Detroit on the regular. There was no center in Detroit. To the extent there was, the Office of Minority Affairs actually was interested as a result of black protest. They were interested in recruiting students from various schools in Detroit and Inkster and Ecourse, et cetera. But something like this, which is the University of Michigan's proposed center of innovation, actually didn't exist while at least I don't remember it existing when we were here. But that's kind of a sign, right? So one argument is that, that this is this, this new thing, this new attempt 
from, uh, to bring together the power of the university and the resources of the city of Detroit, right? This is Dan Gilbert's proposed uh, downtown development. I forgot the name of it, but it sits at the site of the old Hudson's uh, department store downtown where you know, I grew up going there at least every Christmas, right? It's gonna be the largest city, or um, the largest um, tower in the state of Michigan when it's done. And this too represents a sign of kind of Detroit coming back, like a kind of a, dare I say it, a renaissance, right? So here's a stark reality. So this is a map of the Detroit area. Uh, it goes further, as far, far west as Inkster. Inkster is where I grow up, you know, Ann Arbor is somewhere over there. Um, the, uh, the green it represents um, the black population and the lighter green represents uh, less black, uh, like kind of less black density. Uh, the yellow represents uh, white. Uh, the purple represents uh, Latinos. Um, so I think like this is Hamtramck, this is uh, Mexican town, and this is Detroit. And y'all know what street that is. That's eight mile. Now, how is that dynamic produced? How do we have that dynamic? You can go from, say, 1970 to 2020, and that map, that stark line at least, doesn't change all that much. What does change is this area here. This area here is Southville, Michigan. Southville, Michigan, when I was a kid, it was probably maybe 80, 90% white. Uh, my, aunt was, my, my aunt and uncle were one of the first uh, African Americans to move in the South Field. Now it's, uh, I think it's a majority black. That's an exception, but that stark line has been there. You know, what actually produces that, right? I, I talk about this in Knocking the Hustle. What produces that is a dynamic whereby you've got uh, kind of ra uh, ethno-racial hierarchy embedded in physical space and in municipal development to the point where a city like Detroit can become all black and even though this is not the South, right, Canada's to the South, there is still, di there is still segregation dynamics that keep Detroit predominantly black and then predominantly poor and then end up kind of shunting resources away from those spaces, right? That, we can talk about emergent urbanisms, but that dynamic is the thing that kind of characterizes Detroit and the metropolitan Detroit, Detroit area. It's, it has characterized it for the last 50 years, and it'll probably characterize it for at least a few more. When we talk about that Hudson Tower, I mean that, uh, that, that space that Gilbert wants to, wants to build, one of the things that I would point to as a way to think about re-emergence is the Renaissance Center. This is um, kind of a fuzzy picture, but this is, the Renaissance Center was built in, or it, it was, brought, ground was broken in 1970, and it was, um, I think it was finished in 1977. It was actually a coalition of private developers who put more money in developing downtown than any coalition of private developers, including Ford, had ever done in any city. What's important with, um, with the Renaissance Center is, for, for my purposes, are a few different things, but I'll just focus on one right now. Uh, not only was the Renaissance Center the tallest building, it was one of the first modern examples of a certain type of military urbanism. And if we think about how cities function now, there are all these different ways in which cities work to exclude populations. Some of that is by race, some of that is by race and by age. So even if you look at uh, a number of uh, skateboarders, for example, start using the city to, to, uh, to, to kind of skate around, you see these uh, skateboard resistant rails, right? As cities develop homeless populations as a function of the ne uh, neoliberal turn, you see 
Um, benches become homeless proof, right? So there are a number of different ways to think about military urbanism in the current moment. But one of the things that stood out about the design of, Renaissance, of the Renaissance Center was two different dynamics. The first is the front of the Renaissance Center, which faces the city itself, originally had two large moats in front of it, two large barriers. So I remember when I was a kid, I was talking to Josh about this. I uh, channel WXYZ, which is then Channel 7, at 4 p.m. on weekdays, they would have movies. Right, Oprah ended up taking that spot. That spot. Um, but when we were as a kid, and it, it, there would be themes. There'd be like Monster Week, all Godzilla movies. Planet of the Apes Week, all Planet of the Apes movies. Charleston Heston Week, all like Omega Man, like all his science fiction movies. I remember they showed a, a version of H.G. Wells' Time Machine, and H.G. Wells' Time Machine it tells the story of someone who travels uh, into the future. And where he travels, the, popula when he, um, the, the state is divided into two populations. One population that's kind of genetically pure, and then there were the Morlocks who lived underground. When I first saw those, those, that moat and those big, huge structures in front of the Renaissance Center, the first thing I thought of was, oh, this is where the Morlocks live, right? And that was designed intentionally to, as, a, as, a, as kind of a way to, uh, to keep the population that was in Detroit's neighborhood from entering. Right? The second design dynamic, although it's not clear that this was purposeful, I think, I think this was, but I'm not clear about this, is, um, is they're all circular. So I don't know if any of you have been in the Renaissance Center, and a number of you are design, a number of you understand how design functions. If you've got a, a building that's a square shape or has angles, it's easy to navigate, right? But if you've got a building that's shaped like a circle, you actually can't navigate it. You, don't, you can't orient yourself. So it became clear. So one argument is that they, didn't, that, that, that they didn't do this on purpose. And in fact, what they end up having to do was color code the different areas and actually name them so people know they are. But the other argument is that design, they designed it in the form of a circle. So there were certain people, the people who knew where they were going knew how to navigate it. And other people would become disoriented and leave. Right? So this is not just an example of private developers thinking about urban space and coming up with the idea of, of pri basically privatizing the riverfront, which has certain types of political consequences, is also kind of an early example of people actually uh, designing with an eye towards using design to exclude populations. Uh, Joe Louis Arena, I think they just demolished this. Um, I saw Isaiah Thomas score like 12, like 16 points or something like that in like 20 seconds. It was awesome, like in a playoff game there. Um, so Joe Louis Arena, that's a, city uh, that's a city building. So the Red Wings actually threatened to move to Pontiac. Uh, the Detroit Red Wings, uh, the, the, uh, the hockey team, threatened to, to move to Pontiac um, following the uh, Detroit Lions, which had already done so. And, in ex and uh, to keep them in the city, um, then Mayor Coleman Young decided to actually build a stadium. Now the thing is, is Joe Louis Arena was actually owned by the city uh, and built for the city. So the city peeled off some of the profits. But when we think about Fort Field and Comerica Park, um, Fort Field, both were, built, um, both were built with significant portions of public money. When we think about the recently built uh, Little Caesars Arena, that whole area, like that was built with approximately 300, 400 million dollars of, of people's money. We can actually trace. So Joe Louis Arena is around 1980 or so. Uh, Comerica Park and, um, and Fort Field are the early 2000s. And then this is 2020, right? In fact, what's interesting in, in this case is this was built with public money when Detroit was going ba under, uh, undergoing bankruptcy. So the final costs were approximately $820 million, and 
300 to 400 million dollars of that was, was basically public money. So it wasn't as if the whole thing it was public, but a significant portion of it was public money. And in this case, Illich keeps all the profits, all the profits. They all go to, to the Illich family, right? So again, we, can, we could talk about emergence, but there are elements of this stuff that repeat. So this is actually a picture of most of the major properties that Dan Gilbert owns. And this doesn't really begin to capture it because I think Gilbert owns approximately 90 buildings in the downtown Detroit area, right? And we can talk about this as kind of a, again, we could talk about this as a new phenomenon But we can go back 20, 30 years and see Illich trying to do a very similar thing, right? And in fact, you could just kind of track this. One of the ways that like, uh, property works in capitalism and urban space, and you can read folks like David Harvey he talks about this. We uh, can read folks like, um, like Jason Hackworth, uh, Josh's dissertation advisor, right? Uh, he talks about this. You can actually track property values, right? So these spaces, property, when, um, when, when property values go low, like as if on purpose, somebody just comes in, capital comes in and just sucks them up, right? And then it has certain types of consequences. So here we've actually got, in a way, kind of old Detroit capital versus new Detroit capital, right? So that dynamic, again, there are new dynamics, but there's, but there, there are these re-emergent patterns. So one of the things that Dan Gilbert does, you know, again, go, and we can think about, think about the Renaissance Center. One of the things he does, or two of the things he does when he buys up all his property is he actually needs to defend them. So how does he defend them? He defends them in two ways. One way is by installing cameras in approximately 500 buildings in, the, uh, in 500 places in the, uh, in the downtown Detroit area, a lot of them businesses he doesn't even own. Like that, that camera on the top left, um, I forgot the name of the joint, but they, the guy who owns the building came in the alleyway and all of a sudden just saw them putting it up. That bottom picture, the second thing he does is he creates, he creates his own private police service. It's like a separate police department. They have uniforms. I don't, they may even be armed, right? So we can say that this is different than the military urbanism embedded in design that we see in, uh, in the case of, of, of uh, the Renaissance Center, but there, there, there are really these strong similarities, right? And then I'm, I'm doing a deep dive on Detroit, but we can easily connect this to what's happening in other places. So in uh, my uh, kind of new hometown of Baltimore, we've got several, we, uh, uh, my employer, Johns Hopkins, uh, with the assist from Michael Bloomberg, is actually, they actually got the go-ahead to create their own private police force. The city of Baltimore already spends $500 million a year on policing, but Hopkins feels that, that it needs its own private police force, right? They've got, Baltimore is one of the, has all these blue lights attached to a central unit by which everybody is, in fact, not only blue lights, oh my God, <laughs> I keep on, there's so much stuff going on that I, Baltimore has drones. A philanthropist actually gave Baltimore City the money to actually use drones to do flyovers. We didn't know about this until invest, invest, investigative rec, uh, reporting brought it up, right? So again, I mean, it's, it, it's, this, there are elements of this stuff that's new, but 
but there are these patterns. Now, I don't want to, I don't want to end on a downer, and I'm not ending, I'm, I'm, but I'm moving to the end. I, there's a way to talk about the neoliberal turn and its consequences. There, there's a way to talk about capitalism, whether you're talking about surveillance capitalism or carceral capitalism or communicative capitalism or ludic capitalism or formal porno capitalism, that all these things are real, all these terms are real. Um, that kind of removes the possibility of political agency. Right? And, I, and, I, and, I, and I don't want to do that. Uh, and actually here, I actually want to draw on the work of, of two Michigan scholars. Uh, one is James Chaffers, who retired from art and architecture. Uh, he taught me probably my most important class as undergrad. And the other is Austin McCoy. Austin McCoy is a recent history PhD who actually, um, who wrote his dissertation on radical work uh, undertaken in cities in the 70s. Um, these pictures I'm showing you are pictures from James Chafer's library. He just, he sent them to me, some of them like last night. And what we see is uh, around 1965 or so, uh, James Boggs and Grace Lee Boggs wrote an article called The City is the Black Man's Land. In it, they make the argument that deindustrialization is creating a body of, of, of folk that the economy has no need of. And they're being concentrated in certain types of cities. This concentration is gonna end up generating a certain type of black political power. And the argument that James and Grace are making in that piece is, this political power that black people are generating from being in this space should actually be used not only to transform the cities, but to transform the country and the world through transforming these cities, right? James Chaffers actually worked with James and uh, Grace Lee Boggs. In fact, I think I remember meeting uh, James Boggs in his class in like 1990, two years before he passed away. Uh, the class was Urban Redevelopment and Social Justice. It was uh, a class that was um, cross-listed between art and architecture and um, the Center for Afro-American and African Studies. Uh, one of the things that James ended up working on is a set of projects designed to empower people in cities to take control of the spaces that they were in. So what you see here and here are, uh, represent kind of early 70s attempts to transform alleyways on the east side, or no, on the west side of Detroit. With, uh, and James's idea here was that alleys were, uh, alleys could serve as connectors between individuals in ways that streets couldn't. But in order to transform them, they had to literally be, in order to uh, transform them socially, they had to literally be transformed physically. So James worked, and not in a top-down way, not in a way where the designer comes and then the people just take the design, but in a way in which designers and individuals and communities can come together to figure out their needs. And then through that, they build capacity and then they change their environment, right? So what you see here is an, at an early attempt to kind of change an alleyway, uh, and he had several attempts. Some of them were beautification projects, like the one, uh, like the slide I just showed. A number of them were talking about urban gardening as if it's a new thing. A number of them were about changing alleys into gardens, right? Because a number of the alleys had just fallen in into disuse, even for cars going back and forth. So what we see there is kind of an early attempt that we can then see reiterated in Detroit summer. Uh, James and uh, the Boggs, uh, the Boggs is probably most important program. And then in the work of somebody like uh, Malik, I think Yanini is his last name, who's doing work on urban gardens in Detroit and then in other spaces, right? Before there was Black Lives Matter, there was stress. Now, how many of you are familiar, are, have never heard of stress? Raise your hand, those of you who have never heard of it. 
Raise your hand high. Wow. Most. So STRESS stands for Stop the Robberies, Enjoy Safe Streets. It was a program created by, I think, it was the mayor after uh, Kavanaugh in Detroit. It was Gibbs. Yeah, yeah, thank you. It was Gibbs. Um, to basically put police officers in plain clothes, and then when they'd end up being kind of harassed by the element, young black male, they would then arrest them. It ended up resulting in a few dozen murders in a very short period of time. We talked about stop and frisk. Bloomberg caught hell in the debate yesterday and this week, and he should have. When I already knew about stress, what I didn't know was they actually deployed in Detroit a literal stop and frisk policy. The first time I'd heard stop and frisk, it was associated with 90s and 2000 era broken windows policy. No, they were talking about stop and frisk literally in Detroit in 1969 and 1970, right? Bottom left corner, Malice Green. Malice Green was killed in an encounter with police in the mid 80s, I wanna say maybe 85, 86, because I hadn't graduated from high school yet. Top right corner, justice for Vincent Chen. Vincent Chen was killed um, in a bar by two white auto workers who thought that he was Japanese. When we're talking about ethno, the return of ethno-racial hierarchy and the politics of that, in Trump, if we're talking about the United States, uh, I think in Germany, uh, an assailant just killed 15 people who, uh, 15 people in two German hookah lounges, which were primarily, uh, the primary consumers were German Middle Easterners. Uh, and then that person killed himself and his mother. Just, just happened a few days ago, right? If we're talking about Turkey and Erdogan and the Kurds, if we're talking about what's going on in Brazil, even the Philippines, right? We're talking about something that's new, but in the politics and in the political response, we we're talking about Black Lives Matter, et cetera, we're actually talking about something that is kind of re-emerging. Um, I've talked about James Chaffers earlier. Uh, this is a meeting of uh, GROW, and I don't remember the acronym, but GROW was an organization that was started in the early 70s, and it represented an attempt of, of, of black families living in uh, black neighborhoods, neighborhoods that most of the downtown development projects ignored, kind of like they do now, and this was a moment in time where Detroit was trying, attempting to create like a master plan, and this organization was the first organization to successfully intercede in that master plan and inject their own priorities into that master plan. This is the policy meeting where they were able to successfully, um, I-96 is the Jefferies Freeway. The Jefferies Freeway was created like in the middle 70s. I remember the first time I drove on it. There was original plan, like talking about history, there's this history of of, of, metro, of, of not just people in Detroit, but planners in a number of different places, kind of driving highways through poor black and brown neighborhoods, right? Totally destabilizing them. So in this instance, what this group was able to do successfully was prevent the Jeffries Freeway from carving through their neighborhood. It's one of the first such instances, right? Thinking about, uh, I, I mentioned Austin McCoy, Austin McCoy's work examines a number of attempts in Detroit, Cleveland, and in one or two other Midwest cases of, of um, organizers from the radical left all the way to the liberal end of the political spectrum getting together to rethink how a city's economy should function, how politics in a place like Detroit should function. What should be the role of politics? Right? Under what circumstances should radicals, for example, run for political office? Right? I mean, again, with the new Jim Crow idea in mind, it's important to note 
that I'm not suggesting these things are the same thing, right? I'm not suggesting that what's happening in 2000 is just 1970 with different numbers, right? But I am suggesting, if you think about the date, Today's date is February, sec uh, February 20th, 2020, right? You write those numbers down as 0, 2, 2, 0, 2, 0, 2, 0. I am suggesting that there is this level of, there, there's these patterns that emerge and then become more complex and then build on each other. So what I'm hoping is that what we'll be doing over the next few hours and then over the next day and into the future is really begin to think about, you know, take deep dives into the cases that we're, that we're working on, the, the, the two cases in Germany, the two cases in the United States, and then have a rich conversation across cases that actually bring to light the conversation that only we can have in this moment and in this time. And on that note, I thank you so much. This has been dope. <laughs> so why don't we do this? Uh, I know that some of you may have questions. What I'd like to do in order to extend the conversation and give everybody a chance to ask their question is take questions like three at a pop. Uh, my memory started to fail, <laughs> but I can remember three questions at a time, and then we'll take them as long as we can. Um, it's 6.55, so in a second, I'm probably gonna have to take care of my daughter. I'm gonna stop that for a second, but yeah, let's go. Yeah, I got you. In Ann Arbor, there's uh, this talks. Yeah, oh wow, that's dope. <laughs> 21st century, I'll be damned. <laughs> Amazing. Talk into it, yeah. And we're trying to see how this can be developed by the people and not simply a function of the government planners and the experts and the uh, university yeah. saying how it should be. And there are activists who are interested in this, but actually to find the black community the brown community, yeah. the Native American communities, the underheard people to express their own vision in the center of the city where they have mostly been shut out and yeah. feel this is not for us. How do we make that bridge? That oh, could be you. one question of the three. Okay, I got you. And that, that is ongoing now. So anybody that wants to participate in helping this community development of an Ann Arbor Community Commons, it's by the public library on top of a parking structure in the center of the city. And, and, I, and I'm not going to answer. I'm going to take the other ones. But you actually have a sign-in sheet, don't you? What's that thing? You have this, something to sign up for people oh, who are interested? I, yeah, I got my, I'm taking notes. Anybody who wants oh, okay, to yeah. sign, sign on. <laughs> All right. All right, so I got you. Another question. Catch yeah. <laughs> Wait a second. So tell them the question and then say it again so they can, so, because this is being taped, so the, the folk will be able to get you. Um, I don't know if this is a good question, but do you feel that the land, that the Detroit Land Bank is doing anything to help the situation, or do you feel like? what they're doing is more adverse to helping Detroit and its residents move forward. Uh, that's a great question. Uh, number three. Edgar. Dr. Uh, Spence. My man. I hear that the plan for downtown was to essentially gentrify it but from what I hear, that it's even too expensive to live in right now. What do you think is going to happen because of that, if that's true? Uh, so I'll try to go in reverse order. And the, I, the, 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 the land bank question is a good question. I'm not going to fully be able to answer that. I'll, I'll, I'll try to do my best maybe with 
with uh, another case in mind, but I'm not gonna be able to fully answer that. Uh, so what normally happens uh, with gentrification is, um, is that there is a population of folk who are, who are often young creatives. Um, they come into a space and then they kind of transform it and then the values of the land that they've transformed go up and then they're moved out and then they're replaced, right? Uh, one argument is that this is just kind of sort of what's happening now, right? So if you take a, you take a documentary uh, like Detropia, so Detropia is a 2012 documentary about Detroit. Uh, it was okay, uh, I had some challenges with it, but one thing I think it kind of captured was um, this uh, gentr was the gentrifying dynamic where you had these people who looked at Detroit as if it were empty and who were able to you know, use places not quite as big as this, but you know, pretty big and pretty cheap and live in it and then do their art, et cetera, et cetera. Um, not that far from downtown, right? And, and, and kind of make a new life. Uh, and they can't do that anymore, right? They, they, they just can't. So there are two, thinking about it from a, gentrif from a developer gent gentrification perspective, it's possible that what ends up happening is that a developer, or is that what may happen is there are incentives for kind of living right outside that area, but then only to rinse and repeat, right? Um, the other argument is that they, that population served their purpose and, you know, now that you got million dollar homes back in, the, back in Detroit again, you don't really need to do much more. Uh, I, I think the thing to keep in mind, though, is that in both those cases, you're still looking at land from a speculative um, perspective. You're not looking at it from kind of a deep de uh, democratic perspective. Like you're not talking about creating space. I mean, Detroit is, it, 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 some of you probably know this, but it just bears repeating. Detroit is, uh, is so big, you can put uh, Boston, San Francisco, and Manhattan in its borders and still have, still have like 40 square miles left over. Give me a second. Confirmed. Confirming your ride, confirming your ride. This is straight to the 21st century. Like there is nothing, you know, so I've talked about, re this is emergent urbanism. Uber is an example of emergent urbanism. My, my daughter's in Baltimore, I just made sure she got a ride back to the crib in Baltimore. That is actually really crazy to think about. Um, so yeah, I, I think that the, 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 the real question is how do we create a space? How do we recreate Detroit in a way that's democratic and is open to everybody as, a, as opposed to kind of billionaire speculators, you know, who, who might even have their heart, heart in the right place. Um, the, the land bank question. Um, so what I can say is there's a similar attempt in Baltimore. And this actually connects with the question about Ann Arbor. Uh, there's a similar attempt in, uh, in Baltimore to kind of create uh, like, a, like a land that's held in common in order to, uh, for the purpose of kind of, 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 of a certain type of democratic development and to kind of rebuild what we think of as the public. Uh, and the challenge there is to actually build capacity of the individuals in the neighborhood such that they can actually do this in common as opposed to having the idea kind of glommed onto them, right? 
So, um, and that's, that's, so if we think about the institutions in cities that actually built political capital, many of them are in decay or they've been privatized, right? So uh, schools, for example, schools haven't necessarily been privatized, but the idea of a neighborhood school that would serve a neighborhood doesn't exist anymore with the proliferation of charters, right? Um, union density and union membership <coughs> has dropped like a rock because the employment base is something different and nothing is served to fill that space. And community organizations exist, but in a case like Detroit, Detroit is so non-dense, it's difficult for those community organizations to really develop the capacity. Right? Now they can, and there are ways to do it, but that's, that is where kind of the emergent dynamic comes from. It's like, okay, how do you actually, what types of structures can you create when you're in a major city <laughs> The taxi cab driver, uh, the, 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 the driver who brought me here, who brought me from the airport to here, he lived uh, on the west side near Detroit Central growing up. He said on his square block, on his square block, there were 90 kids. Not, not, there were 90 kids on a block, right, 90. And he was like, that was normal. You just reproduced that, 90 kids per block just in a neighborhood. You can... You'd have to, to go, if you went to the same neighborhood, how many blocks would you have to go to to get to 90 kids? Right, how many blocks would you have to, you know? And if you think about kids being kind of the glue that brings people together kind of naturally, naturally, if you don't have kids, then how do you build capacity? So that's, that's something that, that really has to, be, has to be thought about. And then uh, answering the Ann Arbor question a bit more directly, so there are spaces still in Ann Arbor, um, although I, don't, I no longer know where they are because Ann Arbor's changed so much since I, um, since I was really here. There are, are, are spaces where you've got working class folk congregating. You know, whether they're, they're coffee spaces or the few neighborhood centers. The thing is, is how do we use those, how do we use those spaces to communicate across you know, racial groups to, to actually re-educate people on the role of the public and the role it can play, and then to re-educate them as to their actual political power to, change, to transform those spaces. There is no way around that, and it's, a lo it's possible, but it, it, it's, it's, just a long, it's just a long, painstaking process, but that's the thing you have to, that's the thing that has to be done. Kurt. Uh, Professor Spence. Um, appreciate you bringing those words uh, about Baltimore. Um, and given, um, since you were right there during the uprising and the, and the hostilities or rebellion, what, what has changed in Baltimore since those um, incidents? And what has not changed? That's a great question. Um, Kurt, could you stand up? <laughs> so Kurt Smith is actually, a, you're a graduate of the art and art. You graduated from Urban planning. Urban planning, right. Um, he actually produced uh, one of the best documentaries about uh, water politics, focusing on the case of Highland Park. How old is that documentary? We, we finished that in 2007. In 2000, th again, 13 years ago. So we're now having conversations about water uh, in Flint. We had conversations in Baltimore. They tried to privatize it unsuccessfully. Uh, the case of uh, Highland Park, and, and his video really gets at it, uh, or the documentary really gets at it, is an early, is a, is a kind of a quasi-early modern example of, of, of that dynamic. And to a certain extent, it documents resistance, but this was right in the beginning of the emergency financial, um, emergency financial manager moment. And, uh, Highland Park is one of the first cases uh, caught up in that. So if you got a chance to see it, um, I know I ordered it from my library, but, um, but I would check it out. Um, another question. So I have his. On the, I'm going to give you. I'm going to follow up on his question a little bit, right? So you're talking about patterns, sequences. You're talking about development, capital, policing. Um, I would be. I'd be curious to hear you think about what's emerging or reemergence between kind of activist spaces uh, in Baltimore and Detroit. Yeah. 
yeah. uh, encountering these things and thinking about the differences between them. Uh, yeah, yeah. So um, I'm, I actually forgot to mention this slide. So uh, Josh is actually involved in Detroit eviction defense and the urban practice workshops. And for me, these spaces are really wonderful. They're, they they present or these uh, these examples represent kind of examples how to bring together knowledge at the university level with people who are attempting to organize in a way that pushes scholarship forward. I am a scholar, right, and I do believe in kind of building on knowledge, but also pushes the politics forward in an ethical way that's based on people's lived, in exper lived experiences, right? Um, I don't know if Josh and the people he's been working with knew about the examples of Detroit Summer, uh, I imagine you all knew about the Allied Media Conference, both of which are held in Detroit. But there is this longer history, right? Yeah, I could easily attach the work you're doing to grow. Uh, I can easily attach the work you're doing to some of the, um, to some of the uh, early attempts uh, to, to stave off police brutality. But I have, I have that question. Uh, one more? Uh, yes, Dr. Spence, uh, thank you for your information. Um, kind of got a multitude of questions, but one, uh, would be the city governments not taking control in terms of landlords that just sit on the property, wait till it devalues, and then either sell it off real cheap, get money, et cetera, or just let it crumble down, and therefore you have to do something with it. The other is the community development uh, process. In other words, when... Um, What's his name? Um, oh, let's okay. Let's just take the uh, Joe Louis Arena. Yeah. That whole that whole crisis where uh, the Detroit City Council got very little or demand from them in terms of what the community really needed, mm -hmm. and uh, that to me was just an abominable yeah. mistake on that. And the last one would be. Your comment on the $600 million tax uh, crisis that's in the city of Detroit right now, yeah. in terms of what happened on that. and uh, So I'm not going to be able to speak. I just heard about that myself. I'm only going to speak. Uh, so I think that's the issue where, there are, where people were charged $600 million in property taxes that they really didn't know. Right. Is that, am I getting that right? Well, something. Yeah, yeah something like that. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so I think... So taking them in the reverse order. So one of the things that happens as a result of the neoliberal turn, and really quickly, because uh, I haven't really defined that, there may be some people in the audience who don't understand what I'm talking about when I refer to that. So when I talk about the neoliberal turn, I'm talking about kind of a, a policy shift um, that begins in the 70s, that reduces the ability of government to collect taxes, that reduces the ability of labor to organize, that reduces the size and the scope of the welfare state that um, increases the degree to which cities rely on private entities for, uh, for a range of services, and then um, finally, for the purposes of this conversation, that ramps up police, that really, really ramps up police. Um, and then it kind of creates a new human. You know, so we, a lot of us now kind of think naturally in entrepreneurial terms. Uh, and um, naturally, we think that private entities function better than public entities do. And we've, in some ways, even lost the idea of the public. So in this, di this term, which has been going on at least since approximately 1970 or so, what we see is cities losing power. Right? Now, part of this is really legal, where they just can't really, they just can't tax like they used to be able to tax. Right? And that's because of a combination of state law and federal law. But then part of it is uh, kind of a matter of kind of, of, uh, of, of creating fiscal crises that then come with an attending logic that the only way to deal with these fiscal crises is to bring in a combination of high income earners as individuals and corporate development. And then the only way to bring in that corporate development is to basically give it to them for free or something like it, right? So um, in um, the Detroit case, you know, the, the, the tower, the Hudson Tower, that's built with a lot of public money. 
Uh, I use the example of the, um, of the sports stadia uh, in Baltimore. We've got the sports stadia. Uh, Under Armour's headquarters is in Baltimore, and Under Armour wants to create a new headquarters, and Baltimore gave them $600 million, I think, in tax, in tax write-offs. Uh, the worst example is the Amazon example, although that was fought off, where um, the city of Newark gave Amazon, and they didn't get the bid, uh, $7 billion in tax incentives. The state of New Jersey actually changed state law to give them more incentives, right? So that's a dynamic that really shapes how the city functions in relation to people who have low or no income, right? So if we think about the policing dynamic, one of the things that stands out about Ferguson is before the Justice Department report, Ferguson got 21% of its municipal revenue from fees and fines levied on, on citizens, right? Um, when, uh, when, yeah, one of the uh, things that Kurt's documentary about Highland Park shows is that once Highland Park realizes they're, they're money poor and they can use their water, they use water bills, right, for uh, against poor folk threatening to take their house if they don't pay their water bills. Now the thing is, is uh, and that was tried in Detroit and in Baltimore. Now the thing is, is the people who have the biggest water bills that haven't been paid are often who? They're also the, uh, they're often not just the, the not the mom and pop shops, but the big but the corporations, right? But instead of going there. They're going there, right? So a lot of that is, is a lot of that, a lot of what's happening with the examples you talk about is that type of dynamic. And then what you do is you, you know, you elect individuals who believe that that's the way it should be done, right? And again, this has kind of a longer history. I was, so um, an example, I, I, <laughs> I remember Detroit's second black mayor, Dennis Archer, uh, he appeared at the Million Man March, and Dennis Archer's politics weren't black nationalists, although he, you know, he loved black people in a certain way. And I remember in his speech, he was basically telling people in Detroit to do a better job picking up the trash, as if Detroiters didn't already pay taxes for that purpose, right? So th that's a type of natural thing. And then what you do is you punish the people who you're able to punish, and then draw the resources from the people you're, uh, that you think you're beholden to. And that's, and that's basically the struggle that we're waging. Um, that, and that brings back to Baltimore, and then I, I, I'll answer Kurt's qu question first and then get to Josh. Um, so to give you a sense of, of, of the possibilities and problems, so we had a year after the uprising, Baltimore City had an election. And they had nine candidates uh, there were nine of the smartest candidates and capable candidates I'd seen. And because of the uprising and the activist organizing that led to the uprising, um, the solutions that they were proposing to Baltimore problems were the furthest to the left that I'd seen you know, in, in, you know, in the modern moment, right? They, they were supporting drug legalization. They were supporting and increasing the, creating a living wage, not just a minimum wage. Um, they were supporting making uh, Baltimore a sanctuary city. There are all these different ways in which their ideas had moved, had shifted. To, uh, had shifted. So um, Catherine Pugh gets elected uh, in a close election uh, with uh, Sheila Dixon, who used to be mayor until she was removed for, for corruption. Uh, and Catherine Pugh, the first thing she does is she goes back on the living wage proposal. Like city council passes it and she says no. And then she says, like, in the mic, she was like, well, it's not like I put my hand on a stack of Bibles. Right? So Catherine Pugh was recently forced to step down because it was found that she was basically engaged in a kickback scheme with a range of other corporate leaders in the city. So they're, 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 uh, they're, they'll be sentencing her probably this week, right? So we had that opportunity. We actually, we, Kathy Pugh was not the activist candidate, but because of the force of activism and organizers, she had to move. But, but once she was put in office, 
you know, she, she, she had another, uh, she, she changed her tune. On the other hand, we've got more progressive city councilmen that we, uh, city council persons than we've had before. Um, but it's like one step forward, two steps back. You know, Hopkins, uh, again, we, we, we tried to fight Hopkins to prevent uh, my employer from getting its own police department. Uh, Michael Bloomberg actually lobbied for it. Um, there's evidence that, uh, that the Hopkins president and a number of other administrators actually gave money to the mayor who just got arrested. They actually gave money right before she testified in favor of the bill. So it, it's, it, it's a struggle. And it, so that's, that's kind of where we are. I could talk more about that after. Uh, and I guess that kind of gets at, so one of the things that we've been looking at, um, and we actually brought, we didn't bring Josh out, but a group of people had, um, they held a, a kind of a conference on the city at one of the few, uh, one of the radical hubs that Baltimore has, right? So one of the things that even given what I just said, which maybe sound kind of dispiriting, there are a number of spaces in which people are organizing. Like there's a bookstore, Red Emma's, that's, uh, that's actually cooperatively owned by a group of, of anarchists. And that's like kind of the, the center for the radical left, black and white in Baltimore. And we had a conference there and we brought Josh out. Um, I think that there are now, there are a number of places, Detroit, Baltimore, New York, where you've got a combination of independent scholars, uh, car carrying academics, um, organizers and activists who are trying to think about how the city should be governed. And a lot of, in a lot of instances, we're drawing from ideas in other spaces. In a lot of instances, we're drawing on ideas from previous times, right? And uh, that is in process and is not clear it's not clear what's going to come from that, but what I do know is that we're in a moment where things are in flux. Uh, I never thought that I'd be a, I never, never thought I'd be alive to see the day where a democratic socialist will be the likely uh, candidate for president. I mean, that's kind of, when we think about that, it's really crazy. Um, and. I think if we organize with a certain type of intent, then either, then, then something will, will, will either be able to take advantage of this moment or we'll be able to take it, we'll create the groundwork where somebody later can take advantage of this moment. So I'll use a Michigan example to kind of talk about, uh, to, to bring this home in a way. Um, so a few years ago, there was a movement, black, black students here, black, being black at University of Michigan, BBUM, right? Um, to the extent that movement was successful, that movement actually relied on black activists who were working in the late 80s, early 90s in the post-BAM 3 moment, right? So BAM 1, you had a spike where you, that generated political change for black students here. BAM 2, you had another spike. It generated change for black students here. BAM 3 is another spike. You had change for black movements here, uh, black students here, and then for everybody else. But in, but in that moment, there was this, in that, in that gap between 87 and now, there was, we were organizing, but it wasn't as if I could point to victories the way our predecessors could, right? But what we were able to do was create enough of a template for when the moment was right, they could draw on us and then actually get significant victories. I'm talking about the same type of way, right? So we organize now. We don't organize now thinking that victory comes now. We organize now to create the conditions where victory becomes more possible at some time in the future, right? Other questions? Yes, yes I see y'all. Um, and I see you too, Sharice. Yeah. Hi, um, I, I'm, my name is also Joshua, so hi. Um, but, so I, I wanted to sort of ask you about a, a lot of the, um, uh, about your sort of in interpretation of, of creating community, right, and like creating a strong community, especially in the city of Detroit. So 
so if you if you think about it, there are a lot of things kind of going on right now in the city. A lot like there there are efforts there are efforts such as the the community land trust, um, that that isn't necessarily the community land bank, but but yet like that's kind kind of like a culmination of of like th this land bank actually I mean this land trust actually buying up land and actually give like giving the land like to to local local people in the community for for them to build homes on like so so that the, so that the city itself like doesn't have the, the power to, to kind of like upturn or like displace a lot of the, the citizens who don't have the, the money needed and also um, and, and also pe people people of the city are, are trying to are trying to find a way to, to actually um, use their use their, their policing power or, or, or kind, of, kind of like that that urban that urban concept where but where the people of a community can can kind of like have have power and have say in what happens like in in a community setting, um, and, and so kind of, kind of in light of these things, like the the city of Detroit itself is still attempting to to kind of like create create these revitalization efforts that that are essentially going going to um, displace a lot of the people who are kind of dispersed in a lot of these neighborhoods that are now sparsely um, populated. So, um, so I, I guess um, my my question is how how do how do people how do like residents of the city, like, including myself, like kind kind of be, begin to to create like that community dynamic that that encourages people that encourages the people of the city to actually work together to to begin to buy these lots of land together and so like to to begin to make efforts to reopen these schools and things. Like that, and to, to to just improve the conditions in general, because a lot of a lot of what Detroit is right now is not good for for the residents who currently live there, yeah. like, and, and are not good for for the children who are growing up there, because yeah. like all they see is blight around them. Right. So so what what efforts can can be made to to actually what what good examples have you seen um, that that are actually like feasible things for for the people of the city to to do to not get gentrified as well as to sort of like be uplifted and, and work toward like a future that that is possible. Yeah, I guess right. I'd ask. All right, great question. Thanks. Uh, and I think the brother to your right has a question. Uh, hi, Professor. I'm not quite sure whether I'm wrong or correct, uh, but I was thinking about the term catastrophe money, which means that money flows to to some sort of very large scale renewal project, which in a way that um, isolated the resources and the, maybe the environment um, getting far, far away from each other. And I'm just wondering, um, um, in, a, in, the, in the slide you just showed on the screen, which is the LA stuff, because I have been to Detroit for a couple of times, and I, it gave, the city gave, gave me a sense that um, some sort of the government is doing something and entrepreneurs are sending us something, but it still looks a little bit weird to me in a way that, I don't know how to describe it, but I just want to know whether um, such small scale alley community involvement can kind of balance between the, the very big investment from in a, in a setting that the city is being privatized. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna repeat the question back to you, and you can, for the sake of the audience, and also to make sure I'm, I'm understanding it correctly. So you're using, so you're uh, gently pushing back uh, against the alley example, and suggesting that, and asking me to what degree can alley can that type of work contest kind of the big capital dynamics that constitute a lot of what's going on in Detroit? Is that is that a, a good way to think about the question? Okay, thank you. Cherise. Good evening. Do you, in thinking about the, some of the examples of the past, I, I talked to a driver who's doing DoorDash, all of the gig economy sorts of things, uh, post his PhD, and um, they are getting together, some of the drivers, to think about these companies being co-ops. So taking back, like, 
I thought about the, the Uber headquarters, right? So, and then the founders, $72 million mansion, and then the headquarters having separate bathrooms for the administrative staff and the drivers. And these people make you uber wealthy, right? Yeah. And they don't have the, the dignity of using the same bathroom that you do. And I was just thinking from your historical perspectives how what old is new again, um, we've been through this sort of capitalism through segregation, um, where people had to figure these things out in absence of private money or municipal services. And I think about those people, all of us that are going more and more into low wages in the gig economy, any examples in the past of making those cooperatives and bringing that money home? So I hear a, a few things in your, uh, in your, in your questions uh, slash comment. Uh, it's worth thinking about. So it's funny, again, thinking about emergent urbanisms, right? So we think about Uber as this new thing, yet it's still, I can remember going to Baltimore for the first time in 2004, and I forgot where I was. I know I was in the city, and I see somebody on the, on the corner doing this thing. Now I'm from Detroit, I had no idea what this thing was, but he does this thing, and then this car drives up next to him, he gets in and goes off. And I don't know what the hell just happened, right? What that was was a hack. So hacks are unregulated taxis, right? So you can be a hack. And, and, and there are people who need to get from A to Z. They, they don't have a bus pass or the bus doesn't go where they want it to go. So they would just stand outside on the corner and they just, they just do this thing. Now, they used to exist in Detroit, because my, my mom recognized it when I told her what was going on, right? That was illegal. Uber is not, <laughs> right? I mean, we grew up with all types of people who sold weed for money. A lot of those people either are in jail or spent time in jail or had to evade jail. They've got weed dispensaries <laughs> in Maryland now. That stuff isn't illegal anymore. But you've got to have, like, the way the legislation is written now, I think you have to have, like, a million dollars in capital in order to start one. Right? So we can think about something like Uber as emergent, but then with just a little bit of work, we can actually kind of connect it in interesting ways to this earlier moment. And then when you think about the way that labor functions in those dynamics, you could think about the role that the lack of a union or something like it or a lack of robust labor protections have in creating those conditions, right? I mean, and, and, and that's something that, I mean, so, I name, so the name of my book, or the second book, is, is called Knocking the Hustle, right? And as a side, if any of y'all want it, I'll send y'all the PDF. I didn't really write it to get paid. <laughs> I would straight send y'all the PDF. But it's Knocking the Hustle against that, the, the, the gig economy is based on the hustle. That is what it's based on. If you're not, if you don't have two, three jobs, you're not doing it right, right? And we think of that as normal. And people who aren't hustling and then are poor, we kind of naturally blame them. Like, that's a political project. Like, what do we have to do to kind of reimagine that, to reimagine the role of labor and the role of the public, right? A uh, question about um, the, the, la the, the first two questions, I'm going to take kind of together. Um, whenever I was, when I was giving talks about knocking the hustle, I would, I would, because um, the last chapter actually deals with political organizing, right? And I would get questions looking at foreign dynamics or international politics, right? So, because climate change is really, that's the most, that really is the most important issue we face and it is an international dynamic. You're not gonna be able to escape it. I didn't even realize, I mean, people in the UP are, are really affected by it, right? Um, and we're gonna be affected by it soon. Um, and whenever I'd have that international question, may, and maybe this is a sign of my own a narrow political imagination. Like one way to read this talk is to talk about kind of thinking about how we exp expand our political imagination uh, in certain types of ways. Is um, I would answer that question by just saying, you know what? I, I believe that we start local. 
you know, that we have to start local. Like we have to start with, in a, in a, particularly in a, if we're looking at Detroit, much less Baltimore, I think you actually start local, right? Because of, uh, you start by building ties between people in a, in a given space and getting them to understand how their conditions are shared and getting them to understand how politics can actually solve that condition they face. If you're talking about a neighborhood, it functions like that. If you're talking about organizing a union, right? So the example I give in Knocking the Hustle, uh, the example of the Chicago's Teachers Union. As a result of legislation, um, the state of Illinois made it really difficult for teachers to declare strikes, legal strikes. Like they needed 75% of their members to vote. Not 75% of the people in the meeting, 75% of their members to vote. Right? And, but they were able to do it. How did they do it? They did it through years of painstaking organizing, where they were meeting people at barbecues, at bars, in all these different social spaces to get people to understand their, themselves in a certain way and getting themselves to understand that they were in solidarity with one another, and then using that to generate shared political ideas of how the world works, and then to generate a certain sense of their capacity to change the world in the direction that they want it to, right? So my answer to your question is actually the same, in some ways the same as the answer to the question of um, the brother asked about Ann Arbor. It's like we have to kind of start there, particularly if we're talking about land stuff, right? One of the um, things that James Chaffers worked on, actually he worked on a number of things, but I meant to talk about two. I talked about the alleys. The second thing he worked on was he worked on creating multi-family dwellings that were multi-generational, right? Kamari, what up? My son's in the back. I was wondering where you were coming. You been, <sighs> I don't believe you. Um, <laughs> that is dope. <laughs> um, if you think about land, right, if you, if you root it in that neighborhood dynamic, that's the, you, you have to start there. Right? If you're talking about land stuff, you have to start at the neighborhood. And then what you do is you lash that up or alongside of other neighborhoods that are, that are dealing with similar things. And in, this, in that instance, you can actually move both backwards in time, you know, again, looking at the multi-generational stuff that Jim Chaffers was doing. And it, and it was multi-generational because we actually are talking about a politics that's going to require not just cross-racial alliances along class lines, but it's actually going to require multi-generational politics, right? We lie, uh, in, in, in activist circles, we put a lot of weight on youth, where I'd actually argue that we should be putting at least as much weight on senior citizens, right? For both tactical, strategical, I mean strategic, and a range of moral reasons, right? But, it, but that's the way you do it. Now the thing is, is you actually do have capital. Like what do you do? How can you use that type of organizing to defeat capital? I mentioned the Amazon example earlier. So where did Amazon end up going? Amazon ended up going to Queens. Now, and, and, and the thing is, is Amazon's hustle. <laughs> so Amazon, all those proposals that were sent to Amazon, Amazon took all that data, made it proprietary, and now uses it. In all types of cities, including Baltimore and Detroit, sent them stuff knowing, and Amazon knew they weren't gonna get the bid. Like if you would have predicted, like if we would have started this from scratch, what are the top three cities that are most likely to get the bid from Amazon? It's not gonna be anywhere on the West Coast because they are already in Seattle. What's the top three cities? New York, DC, and then maybe Atlanta, right? Everybody else, it was like a crap, it was, you know, it's like, like a lottery ticket, right? So they get to Queens, what happens to them in Queens? Say it louder. They got booted out. Why? A combination of two figures, and I'm simplifying this. Uh, Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez, right? Who, who had, who, and it's important to note, 
there are political reasons, you know, there are kind of anti-capitalist reasons to say that this, is a, that this type of corporate involvement is a bad look, but there's all types of empirical reasons, right? The data, I've got friends of, who study this stuff, the data shows clearly that these corporate dynamics, they never generate the, the di they never generate the revenue or any of the benefits that, they're, that, they're, um, that they said are gonna benefit, and often they would go to these places anyway. Right, and sometimes you catch them saying it out loud. They'll go to these places anyway, right? Ocasio-Cortez recognized that. And she was already part of an organized group in New York. And then there was another political official who was on the committee that actually dealt with the Amazon issue. And that official, and I'm, I'm, I'm actually simplifying it. Some of the details I might be getting wrong. But that official kind of single-handedly said, yeah, no, you're going to have to play ball. Now, the thing is, is Amazon could have fought back. But, and this is really important, capital is stupid. <laughs> and what I mean by that is, is I'm actually taking the victories that capital has been making and shifting it in another way. Capital has been winning so often, they actually don't know what to do when they actually face opposition. Right, they have no idea. So the people who were organizing in New York, once they made the move against Amazon, they were like, yo, um, we're gonna have to be, and get, be prepared for a long, protracted struggle because it's Amazon, right? It's Amazon. Like Jeff Bezos is worth $120 billion, and I calculated that. It, that's approximately $74 for every second I've been alive, literally. Right, uh, Bloomberg is like $38 for every second I've been alive, right? So we're gonna, we're gonna be in a long, protracted struggle and we'll probably lose. As soon as they started fighting a little bit, Amazon was like, yeah, we don't want them. We don't, we don't want them actually. And they gave up, right? So if you start off small and you build the type of neighborhood ties that actually generate political power and political capacity, you can use politics to defeat economics. Now, it, it doesn't happen all the time, but I think you can actually, I, 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 think that, um, I think that there's a line of Marxism that gets kind of the relationship between economics and politics wrong. Like, I, I think of economics as being deeply structured by, by politics. And, and, and politics is the thing we have. All right. um, it's 7.40, so on that note, uh, you know what I want to do? So I, I'm giving shout outs. I, to, so for the people in the audience who like went to school with me or who knew me when I was a kid, can y'all stand up? <laughs> and then uh, finally, could my son, Kamari, could you stand up? So in all these books, you know, people say, oh my God, I want to give a thank, I want to give a shout out to all these people, the mistakes are mine. In this case, I want to give a shout out to all these folk. I would not be here, literally, without them, without their love, without struggling with me politically. Uh, and then in Kamari's case, it's a totally different relationship. I'm so proud of you. Um, the mistakes are mine. I'll see you tomorrow. Thank you.